and welcome to Jewish National Fund's virtual program, Lipsticks, Bullets, and the Covert Operation that Saved Israel During Its War for Independence. This evening's program is co-sponsored by JNF's Israel Independence Experience Task Force and JNF's Arts and Entertainment Task Force. My name is Ben Gutman, and I'm JNF's Vice President of Campaign and the Chair of the Israel Independence Experience Task Force. Jewish National Fund is committed to preserving the stories behind Israel's historical sites, as well as the stories of the many heroes who fought for its independence. We are proud to par partner with the Society for the Preservation of Israeli Historical Sites to preserve, restore, and sustain hundreds of sites all over the country. In fact, JNF's Israel Independence Experience Task Force specifically works to maintain and sustain Israel heritage sites while also ensuring that they remain accessible to all visitors. For more information, please be in touch with JNF professionals, Diane Scar or Mitch Rosenzweig. Their contact information can be found in the chat. Our Arts and Entertainment Task Force brings cultural opportunities to communities in the Negev and Galilee to help these areas flourish. We know that movies, music, dance, theater, and all cultural culture results in a greater quality of life and more educational economic opportunities. Each project, each program, and each partnership is consistent with our strategic vision of population growth in the frontiers of Israel. For more information, please reach out to JNF professional Sharon Joy, her contact information, can also be found in the chat. And to learn more about uh, JNF's task forces, please visit jnf.org slash task force. Did you know that in the 1940s during the British mandate, a group of Jewish people under the leadership of the Haganah built a secret and illegal under the British mandate ammunitions factory beneath a kibbutz where they manufactured millions of bullets right under the noses of British police. Filmmaker Laurel Fairworth's documentary, Codename Ayalon, tells this incredible story of Israeli Jewish ingenuity with a heavy dose of chutzpah as she interviews some of the brave men and women who took part in this effort. Let's take a look at a video clip. This was a secret. And this was a lie. And on the backs of the young people who kept these secrets and told these lies, the nation of Israel was born. This is the untold story of the 45 young people who climbed down these stairs and onto the stage of history. War was in the air and everyone knew it. The conflict between Arab and Jew was about to heat up. The rules of the game are going to change entirely. It's not anymore that we are going to fight some Arab terrorists here and there, but we are going to fight the armies of the Arab states that are existing with their tanks, with their airplanes, and with their full armies. The Haganah, the Jewish underground military organization, had been planning this for years. David must be ready to take on Goliath. Central to the plan, create a secret bullet factory and enlist a group of youngsters to build it, operate it, and to keep it the biggest secret of their lives. Work in the factory placed them eight meters underground, day in and day out, facing a chance of being blown apart by gunpowder and at the risk of discovery by the British. For everything else, you would have gone to jail, I mean, even for terrorist activity or whatever. But for the production of arms and ammunition, it could be death penalty, and there has been death penalties by the British in those days. The danger was to all of us, not only those who worked there, even who worked in, in the kitchen. So if the British came and found us, 
they would be executed exactly like uh, those who worked there. Undaunted in the face of danger, they made the bullets. Two and a quarter million bullets over the course of two years that were credited by Ben-Gurion himself with helping to win the war. Each night, they would load the 9mm bullets into hidden compartments in the Dwarf, a large mobile fuel tanker, to smuggle them to soldiers on the front lines. Each day, they did what it took to avoid detection. The Ayalon Bullet Factory was one of the most well-kept secrets among all the secrets of the Haganah. It was maintained so well, in fact, that it wasn't until someone accidentally moved this washing machine 30 years later that what lay below, what went on below, was revealed. I think we were too stupid to know <laughs> how dangerous it was. And too enthusiastic, we, it was uh, an honor to be called to do something uh, special. They're just ordinary people doing whatever they needed to do back then. And even nowadays, when they tell the story, they know it's important, but they don't consider themselves to be heroes or anything like that. They did what had to be done. This, in their own words, is the story of that time and that place, and of valor, sacrifice, and ultimate victory. We are incredibly lucky to have filmmaker Laurel Fairworth and film composer Rodney Wittenberg with us today. And they will share a behind the scenes look at what it was like to tell this emotional and inspiring story. I'm also pleased to introduce everyone to Sylvia Caroline, chair of our Arts and Entertainment Task Force, who will moderate our discussion with Laurel and Rodney. Sylvia, Laurel, Rodney, welcome. Thank you so much, Ben. And hi everyone, as Ben said, I'm Sylvia Caroline. I'm the chair of the Arts and Entertainment Task Force. And as the founder of the Arts and Entertainment Task Force, I wanted to bring cultural opportunities to communities in the Negev and the Galil to help these areas flourish. This objective is in tandem with KNF's larger vision of developing communities in the North and South of Israel that are desirable for families to move to from the crowded center of the country. One project I'm particularly proud of is the C. Hugh Friedman Music Program at the Sterod Indoor Playground, where we are replacing the sounds of rockets with the sound of music. The C. Hugh Friedman Music Program was established to teach the children of Sterod to play instruments and create an ongoing appreciation for music through enrichment. This program has helped hundreds of children to learn to play instruments and appreciate music. We are so pleased to partner with the Israel Independence Experience Task Force today to bring you this program and highlight how the arts can help tell the stories of Israel and Jana. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Laurel Fairworth and Rodney Wittenberg. Laurel is a 20 year Emmy Award nominated broadcast journalist. For the past 12 years, she has produced news segments for NBC's Today Show, Nightly News, CNBC and MSNBC. On a trip to Israel, she learned about the covert bullet factory and saved, that saved Israel during the War of Independence. At that moment, she vowed to make a documentary about its heroic workers. The movie was completed in February of 2020 and will be shown at film festivals across the country. Rodney is an Emmy award-winning modern Renaissance man. His interests and professional endeavors range from music composition to full-length film production. He's fascinated by discovering what makes things tick and how to creatively intersect with them through a combination of films, storytelling, and song. So let's get to it. Laurel, what inspired you to make this documentary and what are, what are your personal connections to Israel? Well, hello. Um, I, my parents were always very involved with Israel. And even when we were kids, you know, we put in the quarters to, you know, plant trees. And when I went on a trip to Israel, I was struck by the beauty and just immediately connected and going, I actually went to the bullet factory. And when I was there, I said, this story is so important. It has to be made. And if not me, then who? Amazing. 
So when, while you were making the direct documentary, was there something that surprised you the most or is there anyone you interviewed who stood out the most? Well, both. Um, the person that, well, everybody was great. But the person who stood out the most was Shlomo Hillel, who was in the clip that you saw. And he's just such a character and so amazing. And I guess it goes without saying that many of these people went on to do other great things, which makes sense that they were activists and doers when they were young. And they carried that through, not only in the Bulla factory, but in other aspects of you know Israel and making it flourish. Um, as far as being surprised, I got to say that I was surprised that these people kept it secret for so long, like after they didn't have to. I don't know that I could have done that. I would have wanted to tell everyone how fabulous I was. So I was kind of shocked that even after they didn't have to keep it a secret, they did. And we actually asked that on tape. And they just said, you know, people told us not to. And we didn't think it was, we did that big of a, it was a big deal what we did. And we just never told. So I'm glad that I could tell their story being they weren't going to. Well, we're certainly glad you did too. And I've also had the pleasure of meeting Shlomo Hillel and he is, he's a, he's a riot and amazing. Isn't he's still great? Inspired. I mean, he's still, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's done a lot of other things which don't have to do with the documentary, but the man is, you know, truly one of a kind. Absolutely. Um, so what was the most challenging part about making the film? Well, you know, I, like you said in the opening, I was a long time, you know, TV reporter and producer and all kinds of things. So the work wasn't hard. It was actually raising the money. And thanks to JNF and JNF supporters, we crossed the finish line, but I have to say that was the most challenging was raising the money. And the second most challenging thing was actually finding video because it was a secret. So there wasn't, I couldn't, there's no archival material that I could find. So we had, we used actors and, uh, you know, so this is a docudrama because there's nothing to get from those times. So that was a little challenging, but very interesting. And everybody that we hired was Israeli. Love it. Uh, so this question is, is for Rodney. Um, yeah. I come from the music industry, so I'm partic I particularly pay attention to the music. And the soundtrack to this film was, was really integral, integral in captivating the story. Um, on a personal note, the, the end credit song, Miha Ish, has very personal, uh, experience, personal meaning. So I, I had a very emotional reaction to that, and I think it just adds so much. Can you tell us about, about how you went about the music and the, and the influence in the film? So uh, first I'll talk a little bit about the Miha East track. I work, uh, have worked for a long time with a, a world music singer named Phyllis Chappelle. And uh, that is from her album, uh, Naked World. And we, is one of the first songs we started working on way back in, um, wow, in uh, 2013. And she had been singing the song as an acoustic version. And I had this vision of it in my head and so we got some amazing musicians. Uh, one of the members of the Philadelphia Orchestra was playing cello on that and uh, amazing percussionist, uh, Middle Eastern percussionist, Joey Calhoun and, um, and uh, myself. And that is how Mihaish came about. And when I started working on the film, um, I said to Laura, I think I have the closing credits song. What do you think of this? And she said, it's perfect. So that is how that song ended up at, in the film. And um, we're actually in the process of making a, um, a music video that combines footage from the film and performance of the song that'll be available. Sorry to interrupt you, Rodney, but it's, it's a little hard to hear you. So if you could talk uh, a little oh, is that, better? that is much better. Yes. So, uh, th uh, Let's see. So, um, yeah, so there's going to be a music video coming out that is sort of a, a mixture of a performance of, the, of that song from Phyllis and, and intercut with uh, images from the film. Uh, when I sat down with uh, Laurel and, and, and Michael, the, uh, the other uh, part of creating the film, um, I got uh, one of the things that was interesting was I was brought on pretty early because I ended up doing some of the music for the trailer. So I started learning about the film way before uh, you would normally bring in a composer. Uh, usually the composer is the last, one of the last people to get the film. And it's always a mad dash to try and finish it because you're there at the end along with uh, sound mix, sound design, and color correction. But in this case, I was there at the beginning, so, um, so clo fairly close to the beginning, and had many conversations with Laurel and um, about what the music should do, how it should be in the film. And one of the challenges of a 
scoring a documentary is you want to try and create the emotional tension, but you also have to be out of the way because it's all talking heads. And so it's a delicate balance of uh, coming up with these melodies and themes and ideas that give the emotion, but don't step on the dialogue. And so I started off by coming up with a little theme, uh, just, you know, sort of a, a Middle Eastern slash Eastern European little uh, scale series of notes. And then everything is kind of based around that in the, in the film. It's, everything's kind of based around this little um, scale that I kind of put together and, uh, and then just found different ways of creating different types of emotion within that uh, scale. Amazing. So what, Laurel, what, what's one question that you didn't get to ask your subjects that looking back, maybe you wish you did? Well, there's a lot of questions I probably should have asked, but one of them is how did what you do impact the rest of your lives? You know, how is stepping up when your country called on you changed who you were as a person? And we really concentrated more on what they did then than on who they became. And that's something I wish I would have asked, especially because quite a few of them passed on, um, you know, before I could ask them that. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, after, after watching the film, one of the things I love towards the end is when people were talking about why telling the story is so important and how it really, it really is an inspirational story that can be, can be learned from for, for generations. Um, so I think, um, I think that was a, a really fascinating part. Um, for each of you, what was, what was the most emotional part of making the film? Rodney, do you want to go first? Uh, the most emotional part, I, I think, was um, the hours of sitting with these stories as I was working on the music. Just because uh, when you're working on and scoring a film, you're watching the film over and over and over and over again, uh, trying to figure out uh, what exactly goes with what. And um, that was pretty emotional. Like just in, in thinking, you know, as I'm hearing these stories, putting myself, how would I be at, at 18, 19, 20? Would I make this sacrifice? What would I do? And what was that like to have to uh, be that secretive and knowing that you could get caught and knowing the meaning of it all, like what you were doing was so important. Uh, so that was pretty emotional for me. And I think that also drove what I was able to put into the music. Yeah, what, was very, what was very emotional for me was we had some people interview Shlomo and Yehuda Ayalon, the woman that was in the film, um, before we got there. Because in order, you have to make a trailer first and before you actually do the film to raise the money to be able to go over to Israel and shoot it and do all the things we needed to do. So the night before we got there, she passed away. Wow. Yeah. And so... Thank goodness we had her and just arriving in Israel and finding out that she was gone. It was like, thank goodness I had her story on tape. If I hadn't done that, it, I mean, we could have found out the story, but not in her own words. It's not the same thing. And while we were in Israel, um, her daughter said, oh, we were going through her things and we found her diary from those days. Would you be interested? I said, yes, <laughs> we would be. So it was very emotional and moving to go through the diary knowing that she had been instrumental and so proud of what she did in putting this together with the crew because we were in dialogue with her and actually we had set up with the IDF the young people because we wanted also to what they did how did it impact the younger soldiers and they came that day and um, they were expecting to connect with her and she wasn't there. And so they didn't have anybody who really, the people who are allowed to speak were only speaking Hebrew and mine is not that good. So I asked the question is in English. We had a translator who loosely translated what I was saying and she answered in Hebrew. And then when we got back to the States, we had it translated to make sure it was exact, you know, what she said. So that was the whole thing of the shoot was very emotional because Yehuda had set it up and wasn't there to see its completion. Wow, I just got emotional thinking about that. I mean, and how much that must have meant to her family as well. Oh yeah, they were, you know, and to her, she was really happy that we were doing, so at least she knew. Yeah. And she knew that she had been interviewed. So 
that's why um, what drove me to do this is I felt that their stories in their own words needed to be preserved for future generations. It's a great story, but it's also a motivating story. And okay. so, you know, when I told them at the bull at the Bullet Factory when I was there the day that I went through, I said, you know, I think this would be a great documentary. And they sort of said, yeah, hmm, whatever. I couldn't understand it. Well, it was only when we came back to shoot it that they told me that hundreds of people had told them that, and we were the first people that came back. So they'd heard it so many times. They sort of thought we were one more American group that was saying that, and they completely changed when we actually came back and shot the film. But I wasn't the first to think of it, but we were the first to do it. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned how, how it's such a, a motivating and inspiring story, which I think leads into to my next question, which is, what is what's the main takeaway you want audiences to, to take from the film? That a few people can change the world. You know, in fact, that's the only way things do change, right? So 45 teenagers, uh, I think it's, I might be exaggerating a little, but basically changed the course of history. I mean, there were other people who stepped up. They weren't the only ones, but, you know, they couldn't have fought back the Arabs without bullets. They had guns, but no bullets. So what they did was instrumental in saving the state of Israel in its infancy. So what I want people to take away is you too can make important changes with just a small group if you believe strongly enough. And I think that's a message that's timely now and it's gonna be timely in the future. Absolutely. Um, so just, just to end off, are there, what other stories, are there any, any in particular about Israel that you're looking forward to tell in the future? Well, I vowed never to do this again. And of course I've already broken my vow. And so we are, I'm not allowed to say, but we are working on some other uh, pieces. We have one, it's, it's more um, a Jewish story than it is per se an Israel story, although there are, Israel components in it and if anybody is interested you know please go to Facebook I alone documentary page and like our page and it'll have the list of the film festivals where the film's going to be any new developments all kind of stuff and so once you you like the page we'll send out information so we have um, this film has been accepted to a number of film festivals and for 2020 virtually film festivals, and it will be going into even more work being considered for all around the world for 2021. And as soon as we get officially accepted and we're allowed to tell people, we'll put it up on our Facebook page and website, you know, ilonedocumentary.com. So please come. We want you to be part of it. We want you to see the whole film. And um, now what's happened is I got the bug and we're going to make another film. I love it. Of course. Um, so actually, before before we completely close off, you know, Rodney's sitting there in his, his studio <laughs> with his piano and guitars, and we'd be remiss to 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 not ask to hear a little bit of the music. Uh, what I can do, let's see, is I can show you just a little bit of how I compose the theme. So if you follow me over to get to the piano here, so I was talking about the scale. <laughs> So that's kind of what I was playing around with. So when I go. So that's kind of the foundation for uh, the score for the movie and when you hear the score in the film, it's fully orchestrated, which I can't do by myself right now, but you'll hear it um, done in a whole bunch of different ways. You'll hear sort of a militar militaristic version. There's some darker versions. There's uh, all different ways, but that's basically how a score starts out is just like this little idea, a little melody, a little theme, and then you orchestrate it and add other instrumentation to it and bring it to life. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. And um, as Laurel mentioned, and I, I believe we'll put it in the chat, but please, there's the ilonedocumentary.com where you can uh, get all of the information about the film and film festivals and where it will be playing. 
Um, so thank you so much to Laurel and Rodney for telling this story and taking the time today to share with the audience the behind the scenes look at what it took to create this important film. I'd like now to introduce you to Michael Kessler. Michael serves on the Israel Independence Experience Task Force and holds several national and local leadership roles with Jewish National Fund. So Michael, please take it away. And, and when she says local, if you can't tell from my accent, it's uh, from New York. So I'm based in New York. I'm president, proud to be president of the Tri-State of the JNF for New York. And I'm also proud to be chair of MACOR, which is a national organization, which uh, one of the great things that happens with that is I get to go to Israel with my peers and see where the money that you donate gets spent. And one of my trips to Israel, I was really happy to go to the Alion Institute. And um, it's really quite a place, but I wanna tell my personal story. My uh, father-in-law is a Holocaust survivor who uh, immigrated to, it, when he was liberated, went to Israel after the war. And he was placed in various kibbutzes and ended up in the Gush Etzion, and a kibbutz called Revadim. He actually fought in the War of Independence. Um, he was captured by the Jordanians, he was a prisoner of war, and then was set free after Israel became a state. Um, we, my wife and I, dedicated in his honor the gardens and landscaping at the Gush Etzion Visitor Center. After that project was complete, um, I was really interested in heritage sites. I think that it is really important that not only do Israelis know about their heritage, but that tourists know about Israel heritages, especially the Jews that come. I probably know for every 10 friends that I have that go to Israel, six of them go to the Bullet Factory and none of them know it's a project of the Jewish National Fund. That really struck with me that here it is, a heritage site that tells such a great story that was a secret during the war under the British that made two and a half million bullets before the war and another million and a half bullets after the war. Ben-Gurion credited those bullets with changing the landscape of Israel. And those are the very bullets that my father-in-law used fighting for Israel's state in the Gush Etzion. But again, it's now a secret to Americans and Israelis that the Jewish National Fund really cares not only about changing the landscape of Israel, but preserving its heritage. And to me, I took it as a personal challenge. So my wife and I are the proud benefactors of the revitalization of the bullet factory, changing the lobby, making it more modern and much more user friendly. And I have to tell you, when you get involved in a project with the Jewish National Fund, it's not only giving money, it's not only putting your name on a building. You could be involved as much as you want or as little as you want. And I have gone to Israel several times, met with architects, met with engineers, met with the Society for Preservation employees to design what I call will be a state-of-the-art visitor center at this bullet factory that we could all be very proud of. Israelis, and American Jews and from all over the world because it's really going to tell the story in a, at a first class facility and more and more people are knowing about this secret thanks to people like Laurel who's trying to spread the word, people like us who are telling people to go see it and it needs to be told in a first class way because the way it is now it's great it's a 19 you know, it's, night, it's an old kibbutz kitchen, but it needs to be up to date with technology. And that's what we on this task force are doing on a daily basis. And if you get involved in Jewish National Fund, you will have the opportunity as well. I think I said enough. Um, it's really my pleasure to be involved both in the Jewish National Fund and this project. But now I want to turn the ball over to Cindy, who is uh, not only a friend of mine, but she serves on the task force as well. And she does have many local role, role, roles in her region as well. So Cindy, it's 
your turn. Thank you. I would just briefly like to say that um, being on a committee with people like Michael who take their personal histories and then use it to give to Israel, to connect to Israel and to help the next generation realize um, the treasure that was and is and will be Israel is, um, is really inspirational. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sylvia, Laurel and Rodney for an incredible job. And this is really a thrilling story. Code Ayalon is such an important movie. The sacrifices that these brave, made, these brave teens made is, is stunning. And you should make sure you see it when it comes to a Jewish festival near you. So um, as you know, these young teens um, played a key role in the defining chapter of Israeli history. And the work that Jewish National Fund does for the land and people of Israel has always played a key role in the history of this amazing country. And it wouldn't be possible without your continued generosity and support. Your commitment empowers us to plan for Israel's future. And we need your continued investment now more than ever. Shortly, you will receive a text message and email from JNF with a link to donate. So please join me and my friends at JNF in supporting Jewish National Fund and help make us ensure Israel's future today and always. Thank you, Cindy. And since we still have a little bit of time, we have a few Q and A's from the audience, which um, for Laurel and Rodney. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these. Um, a question from the Rosners, Laurel, were the scenes of the bullet factory shot on location? Yes. They were, and actually we also built some sets because there were things that weren't there. So in addition to hiring local crews, shooting at the facility, building the sets, we also had period costumes um, that were appropriate to the time, you know, down to like the insignias on their military outfits. So yes, everything was done there. Great. and. Um... And I, I did see a few a few questions in the chat as well about about visits to the factory. It is, as we've said, it, it's now a museum um, that JNF that JNF supports, so it is available as soon as we can get on planes again. It's available <laughs> uh, to visit. Um, another question here from a family member of mine: uh, To what do you attribute the seeming contradiction that the participants recognized the importance of what they were doing, and yet? told you and acted as if it wasn't such a big deal? I think they subconsciously knew it was important, but they felt that many people did important things. They downplayed their role. So I wouldn't say that they thought it was nothing, but it was, yeah, we just did what everybody else did. No, you didn't. So I think they're very self-deprecating, which is admirable. And Jewish trait, right? <laughs> completely different. That's what it, it was just interesting to me. And plus, I think they're from another culture. They're from another time where people weren't boastful. And, you know, it, it's just another way of being that we, we did what had to be done kind of thing. It, it was it was surprising to me. They weren't bragging. They weren't crowing about it. It was very matter of fact of what we did. And I tried to get them to say, you know, how fat, you know, how important it was that they did, how unique it was. And really uh, the woman ha, ha, who was in the film and said, we, maybe we were too stupid, you know, too young to really know. And she starts laughing. And, and that was the most I could really get out of anybody. Yeah, I love it. Um, a question from Beth, were any of the factory workers unwilling to be in the movie if, they, if that, that were alive? Anybody who was alive was happy to talk about it. I think so long had uh, time had passed between what they did and when we were actually interviewing them, similar to, although I'm not likening it in the experience, but to the Holocaust, that people didn't want to talk about it because it was, it was so traumatic for them. But in the beginning and then in their later years, you know, they wanted to share it. So if you can just in that sense, liken it that when it happened, it was too fresh, they you know, they moved on with their lives. They didn't want to. And now as they were older, 
it had a different sense about it and they wanted to communicate their story for others to know about. So no, everybody was very happy to be in it. And there were the people who were involved in the Bullet Factory, the 45 people, they all talked. And then plus remember that people on the kibbutz above didn't know it was happening. They were called giraffes. They could see out, but they couldn't see down. And we got a couple of them to talk, which it was very funny, their perceptions. So no, everybody spoke and um, I think was very happy that we were you know, put, putting their recollections on tape. 